in dealing with sawing, saw blades, saw frames, and making parts using the saw. If we look at these saw blades, they are very, very tiny. This is about the spread of, uh, of blades that are available from supply houses. The blades used most frequently by the clockmaker are the mid-range blades. There is a very good reason for learning to use the mid-range blades. Uh, one is the economic aspects of not having to have as many uh, sizes of blades. Another is the fact that a coarse blade cuts a wider curve, requires more effort in sawing, and is more difficult to guide uh, to a close cut line. The smallest blades have uh, uh, uses for uh, specific applications, but uh, are so delicate that uh, the breakage rate is pretty high if you uh, are cutting fairly substantial thicknesses of material or attempting to uh, cut very fast. Let's look at the saw frame. This frame is approximately what most people buy when uh, they're looking for a jeweler saw or a clockmaker's saw. This is adjustable with a screw here for length, has a clamp for the blade, and um, uh, uh, either end. This frame is uh, made in Germany. It's imported by Hamel Riglander Company and is a very popular frame. However, that frame is not really suitable for most clock work and I'll show you a little later uh, the reason. This is a shallow frame here. Uh, only cuts about two and a half uh, inches deep or possibly a little more. Uh, this particular frame, I believe, is a C&E Marshall frame from many years ago. Uh, it's uh, quite strong and uh, also is a good saw frame. Each of these saws are good, but like screwdrivers, there is no such thing as a universal screwdriver. It's just not that way. There is no such thing as a universal wrench. Uh, even though our crescent-style wrenches approach that, there's no such thing as a universal plier. Uh, if the work you're doing is uh, uh, not of very high uh, excellence, maybe those things can be fulfilled. But for good sawing, good clockwork, you need a variety of frames. This is the smallest frame I have. I wish that I could locate one approximately an inch deep. And this is the deepest frame that I have and a couple of sizes uh, in between. I would recommend to the young clockmaker that you buy a frame about this depth. Now let me tell you why. This frame, if you look at this, you see I can flex the, the frame. What this means is that when I'm making the back stroke, if there is a bind in the blade, it slacks the blade and that usually results in uh, kinking it in, a, in the tooth area in the gullet of the tooth and the blade breaks. This is the maximum blade breaker in a saw frame. This frame being shallow has much less flex to it and is uh, considerably better. Why is it better? Most of the cuts we make will not require a depth greater than this frame depth. Therefore, it's easier to handle, it's kinder to blades, and uh, uh, it's lighter to use. So this is the favorite size unless a frame is needed that definitely requires the depth of the greater frame. It's not that the saw is not good, it's a misapplication of the particular saw. Now let's talk about installing a blade in the saw. Classically, the uh, craftsman's hacksaw cuts on the forward stroke. Cuts making the forward stroke. That means the teeth point forward. The frame is strong, and this is an acceptable method of cutting, and it's, it's the common method used. However, you cannot push a blade 
It is this size. I don't know if we can see this on the... Maybe if I... Well, I'm just not sure that we can see that blade. It's, it's uh, uh, so tiny. As a matter of fact, it's difficult to find the teeth in that blade. And the way you find the teeth is not trying to look at it through a glass, but just pull it between your fingers. You can feel the direction of the teeth. You can see which way they're pointing and uh, how to assemble that into the uh, frame. For the sake of illustration, let's, uh, let's use a, a heavier blade that is more visible in the uh, photography. Possibly this one is uh, one of the larger ones that I uh, uh, have. And uh, if we feel of this, as I slide my finger over it, I can tell that the teeth are on that side of the blade. I can tell they're pointing up. Now, as I install this in the frame, I want it like this. I want the uh, teeth pointing up, and I want them pointing toward me. Now, here's how that you do this. You take the, the saw and... Uh, Slip it in the slip the uh, blade in the near jaw first, like that. Tighten it up. Loosen the back clamp, and I see my blade is a little too long for this particular frame. I'll let the frame out just a little bit. Uh, we want this so the blade will be straight. This end's not hooked up. We loosen the clamp. Now. There's all kind of imaginary uh, ideas that this nut here is to catch the blade and tighten it up tighter. And if you want to do that, it's okay. But it's a waste of time. Push the saw against the bench. Tighten the blade. I don't think that we can see that in the uh, picture uh, because of where the uh, photograph is, uh, where the camera is. Let's do it this way. I push the, the uh, frame against the, the bench uh, with my hand, one hand, and tighten with the other. Let's look down this way. Let's, let's get the idea uh, clear. The uh, frame clamp is loose. You just push down on it, tighten that. Now, the blade is completely tight, completely tight. Possibly you could hear that in the microphone of the camera. I move that up closer and uh, we're ready to cut. Feel of the teeth pointing toward me. Uh, the teeth are pointing up. I hold the blade as I uh, load this in the frame. I hold the, the frame bottom up. It's the reason I want the teeth up. We'll cut, we'll saw with it turned over this direction. Now, if I were loading this uh, saw, I would have the same thing, but I could never, because of the spring, if you can see the spring in the frame, I can never have the frame as tight as I can with this one. Now what does a slack frame do? Let's load a blade in this and see what, uh, uh, what we have. Uh, for this purpose I'll disregard where the teeth are pointing and we'll set this in the frame, tighten up in the same manner like this. The blade's tight hear that in the microphone. But let me show you this. Can you see what happens to the blade when I flex the spring? See this in the in the camera. Alright, that's the thing that brings about your, your breakage. So when you use the deep frame, you must saw with much greater care and be very careful that the back stroke does not hang up in the work because if the back stroke hangs up it pulls the slack in the blade, and that becomes the breaking action. I personally keep a group of blades laying on, uh, on my bench over to the right of where I work, and each time that I'm finished, I slip the blade out and lay it aside. I never store the frame with a blade in it, because it'll usually get broken in the, in the toolbox. Blades cost uh, uh, 15 or 20 cents a piece, and it's a breakage that there's just no reasonable reason to permit it to happen. Now let's talk about sawing. How do you saw with this? The object is to saw as you pull. The object is also to cut to a specific line, to
to a dimension, to a drawing, or cut to a plan so that it, there is very little refinishing required. Always save your scrap because when you need a small piece of uh, uh, material for something, get it from that scrap. This piece of scrap uh, is, uh, I suppose that's about uh, two and a half inches across there. That piece of scrap has been in my uh, uh, raw material stores for many, many years. Uh, obviously, I can see from this scrap what it has made. A wheel has been cut out of that area. A wheel has been cut out of this area. If we look at this, if we look at the point of this, that has the image of a click paw having come out of that. This has the image of a wheel coming out of this area and one out of here. And I don't know what would have uh, would have come from this little loop, but save the scrap. Let's look at this piece. Uh, this looks like is uh, salvage from something. It looks like some type of a clock plate. Uh, but a part has been cut from that. A piece has been cut from this. One from here. That looks like a machined hole there. Something has been cut from, from uh, this area. So these pieces are yet valuable uh, where small uh, parts are used. This piece has had uh, pieces cut from it, likewise, and this one. Now let's see how that we go about uh, the cutting. Suppose that um, we are prepared to make a drawing of the part that we want. Uh, possibly you can see the red that is in this area right here. That red is a, and some red over here on, on this area down here, that, that red is a lacquer-like chemical that is called dichem. It's a dye, it's a chemical dye. It's uh, approximately like a uh, lady's fingernail polish, comes in a, a little container of about uh, half a teacup full with a brush, screw top and a brush. You paint the dichem on this and in uh, a minute or so it's dry and then you can take a scriber and lay out the image of what you want to cut. Well, that may be a problem because dichem uh, costs several dollars for a little container. It dries up rapidly and uh, it even locks its cap in place so you can't open it. So as a, as a long-term casual uh, uh, need for the material, it's really not too suitable. There are some other things that uh, work almost as well. And let's talk about some of the other items. This particular pen has the trade name of Sharpie on it. So does uh, uh, this one. These are two permanent marker lacquer pens or something of, of a lacquer type. Now let me show you how we use the Sharpie pen. Let's take the black. If we want to lay out something, we can coat this. We can coat this with the black. Now we can lay out whatever we wish to cut with the scriber on uh, that material. Uh, this can be taken off uh, with a little bit of effort. It's not quite dry there. I can wipe it off with my fingers. But a little bit later, when it's completely dry, uh, there are various solvents that, that will remove it. Let's look at the blue. Uh, Sharpie. I like the blue, I suppose, because I just like blue. Uh, either one of these uh, works uh, quite well. When you paint blue uh, on uh, yellow, you come out with a green hue. But the object is, anything that you can write on or mark on uh, is uh, suitable. You may find on a piece of steel material that one color is more suitable uh, than the other. Now, let's uh, talk about how that we saw something and how that we saw it to a line. A tool that we need for sawing can be readily made. This is nothing more than a scrap piece of wood. A piece of hardwood might do you a little better. Uh, this is about five-eighths of an inch thick. You'll notice that it has a, a saw curve in uh, uh, the end here that's uh, 
oh, I suppose it's approximately an eighth of an inch wide. Has one in the uh, other end that's not quite um, uh, so deep. This is oh eight inches long, a couple of inches wide. Make it however you wish. This is one of the most useful tools that you'll ever use with your sawing. I'll turn the camera off a moment and mount this on the uh, uh, bench and then turn back on and, and show you how it looks and, and uh, how to use it. Since the previous uh, uh, photograph, I've mounted this wood block on the uh, workbench here. This is a large C-clamp that holds it in place. I prefer the C-clamp on the bench to a permanent uh, bench pin that says when I'm doing considerable sawing I can set it on at various angles, various depths, whatever it may be. When I'm finished I set it aside and uh, then it uh, does not encumber the uh, uh, bench while I'm doing something else. Also while uh, I had the camera off I painted a little spot on the uh, 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 this piece of brass painted it uh, blue and I don't believe that we can get the the image of the line in the uh, photograph here. I have a scribed line about five thousandths of an inch uh, uh, wide right down this. Now the way that we will uh, uh, work this, uh, two things, we can either clamp this to the bench or we can hold it between our fingers and uh, we will use the saw in the saw slot saw in the saw slot of the wood, use this for a hold down, cut pulling down, and follow the line. And uh, I may have to get my hands in the, in the way here to uh, uh, begin this. We'll start with the down stroke, and uh, if you uh, look at your watch and find this situation, let's see how long this takes. into the uh, focus of the of the camera. I don't don't think we can. We can see just an image of it. I'm I'm this deep in the slot. That slot is about uh, five thousandths of an inch wide, right down the scribe line, and uh, I suppose that it didn't take more than a minute or so uh, to cut that slot. Now, it's relatively easy to saw within five to ten thousandths of an inch of a line with a uh, small blade if you so desire and do a little practice. Now, in doing that, be careful with your saw and it saves you lots of finish work. And now you can make anything with the aid of the saw and with the aid of a file, you can make any part that your heart desires. Anything you can conceive in your mind and, and draw off with your hand, you can uh, cut that part right out of a piece of material. This piece of brass is about uh, a tenth of an inch thick, uh, scant, uh, eight, uh, scant eighth of an inch. It's uh, commercial brass. Let's see how thick it is. No, it's not as thick as I thought. It's, it's um, uh, seventy-eight thousandths of an inch uh, uh, thick. And uh, that is very easy and very quick to cut out. Now let's let's think about uh, another type of, of sawing. Suppose that we're dealing with uh, rounds or squares or rods or uh, that type of material. Uh, give me a moment and we'll make a setup and take a look at that. I was gone about a minute in making this change. The bench pin with the C clamp is away from the uh, bench now. This particular rod here is an eighth of an inch in diameter. This is a brazing rod. This is a commercial brazing rod. 
they cost about 65 or 70 cents a piece for rods that are uh, three feet long. I use these almost universally in making bushings for clocks. Any clock that can be uh, uh, bushed with a bushing that is uh, uh, approximately an eighth of an inch in diameter, I use this rod for the material. It's hard bronze. It is a very, very superior uh, bushing. I have uh, uh, inspected some clocks that I bushed over 40 years ago and observed the wear on them, and I am convinced that there is none better. It's not necessary to spend as much time in burnishing the holes to hard surface the, uh, uh, the pivot holes because this is hard bronze already. It doesn't machine as well as uh, brass, but uh, if you become accustomed to machining it and the techniques, it's very easy to make the bushings. I can make bushings very, very uh, quickly uh, using this material. Now, let's say that we need to cut this off to make whatever that uh, we wish to make out of this rod. Let's say it's going to be a turning or it's something that we would file or saw up or whatever. I use a little palm green uh, drill press vise. This is one of the smallest sizes of palm green vices. That's about an inch and a half wide or inch and a quarter wide, I suppose. Let's uh, just look at it and see what it is. It's an inch and a half wide. That's an inch and a half wide. It opens about an inch and a half. I cut these uh, uh, grooves down the sides of it here on the two sides. I mill those in there so that I can latch that down with hold down clamps on my little uh, uh, Derbyshire milling machine. Let's see how we would load a part in it to uh, 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 to make a saw cut. First thing we have to figure out whether you're a right handed or uh, 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 left handed. Well, I being right handed I being uh, uh, right-handed, it's more convenient to saw on the left side of the vise. More convenient to saw on the left side of the vise. Let's put this piece in here and, and look at that. All right, we have the piece in the vise hanging out the left side. Why did I turn the handle the other way? I don't want the handle in my way while I'm sawing. Why do I saw on the left side of the vise? I don't want that these wing nuts in the way of the vise. I want to saw close to the vise so that uh, I have a good sturdy setup. It improves the accuracy of the cut, reduces the probability of breaking the blade. I have an overhang here of about three sixteenths of an inch and let's saw off this round. It takes a little longer to saw this. Simple reason being that uh, uh, this, this bronze is considerably harder than brass. You might work the saw up and down and around that reduces the uh, uh, total contact area where the pressure is. And if you'll notice where the forefinger of my left hand is, that's just right if this blade breaks. I need to dig that saw into my finger. So when I put my finger up there, I say be careful. Be careful. Don't dig the blade into it. Now, let me turn the camera off and see where the piece went that that come off of there. Well, it's been about 30 seconds. I didn't see the piece. It's not worth hunting. Just cut the second one off. I saw it off again. We'll see if we can be more careful this time, not lose the piece. When we get into some lathe work, I'll show you the um, techniques that are needed to keep from losing parts on the lathe. It's very easy to keep from losing the small parts on the lathe if you follow some, some uh, good machining practices. Uh, I don't really know that there is a good technique to keep from uh, losing a piece like this that you cut off. You just might lose another. Uh, one of the things that... Um, that uh, and we lost the second one. I'm not going to hunt it. We'll, uh, we'll do this again. Do it again sweep the floor one day here about the end of the day and and uh, we'll probably find both of those. Through this we go. This, uh, this blade has been used many times before. It's not necessarily a new blade even though it's uh, 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 loose here. It is uh, one of the blades that I use from on a regular basis. Uh, let's see if we can catch this one. And here we are. 
Alright? Let's look at the piece that we've sawed off. Uh, I don't know that I can even get that into possibly against this darker background here. We may be able to, uh, uh, to see the piece. But uh, in, in normal practice, this is not the way that uh, you would cut a rod off. Uh, the first ground rule in making small parts, the first ground rule is to make the part with a handle on it and let the last operation cut the handle from the part. I would not saw this piece and place it in the lathe and drill it and uh, machine the ends of it to make uh, a clock bushing. I would go into the lathe, or I do this, go into the lathe with about this much overhanging the chuck of the lathe. I turn a slight taper, break the edge, drill a hole, chamfer the hole, come back behind with a cutoff tool and cut it off. Now, all the time it's been in the lathe. The hole will be perfectly concentric with the uh, uh, OD. I cut it about 90% of the way off into the hole. About the time you begin to feel the uh, uh, tool going into the hollow, you stop, take a little plier, break it off, slip a brooch through the hole right then. Slip the brooch through the hole and now you can hold the piece without losing it. Swap ends with the brooch, put the piece back in the lathe collet and machine the other end of it. Slip the brooch back in it and take it out. Keep it strung on the brooch until you're ready to place it in the clock plate. Now this is a, a technique in sewing rounds. You would do about the same thing in sewing uh, 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 squares, flats, what have you. Possibly in sewing the flat. <coughs> Possibly in sewing the flat you might want to hold this down with a C-clamp. You may have a desire to screw this in a vise and um, uh, saw in the vise. That's well and good. Don't attempt to saw up high where it's springy like this. I use this vise. I have uh, a couple of sizes that's smaller than this. I also use uh, uh, several sizes that are larger. Now let's look at another vice situation here in a moment. Looking at the vice situation, here we have a small watchmaker's vice fastened to a small hardwood block. Hang it on the table with a large C-clamp. Now we have all the advantages of having the vice on the bench if we want to file, uh, if we uh, desire to saw, file, drill, whatever we wish to do on the bench, and when this is uh, uh, finished, it's as simple to take away from the bench as that. Looking a little further at the saw blades, you will probably find it uh, uh, better to buy your blades by the gross. Uh, I don't know what they cost a, a gross this day and time. Uh, uh, probably about twelve dollars. Uh, uh, 1987 prices. These little bundles that uh, we have wrapped up here, that has a dozen blades in it. That's about a uh, dollar, a dollar and a half worth of uh, blades. And they come in uh, bundles of 12 or you can get them uh, uh, assorted. A uh, good starter is to buy a gross of, uh, of assorted uh, blades. These are made in Germany. This is the Hercules uh, uh, brand uh, blades. These that are loose are the ones that I keep lying on the bench here that I use from from time to time and uh, as I finish a sawing job I always remove the blade from the saw on the spot because that saves the uh, uh, saves the blade. All right. If we have the part that has been sawed out then we may begin to finish with a file or we may drill subsequently drill uh, holes, uh, pierce holes uh, with a staking set or uh, whatever. Uh, if we are filing, if we're filing, 
we generally need the part, particularly if it's small, in a good smooth jaw uh, vise so that we can try out uh, square edges, straight lines, uh, 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 true curves or arcs, and uh, make professional looking uh, parts. One of the things that we will find is when we finish uh, our parts is that if we uh, lay a piece of abrasive paper on a flat bench and take the part and wipe it on it and we can finish it with a straight fine line finish and remove all forms of blemishes and tool marks. You can truly make professional parts by handmade techniques that uh, are, are truly as fine as anything you find in commercial clocks. It's a matter of attitude and um, a matter of uh, 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 desire of the heart and just a little bit of practice. Sawing, sawing is a very valuable tool to the uh, clockmaker, particularly the person that is restoring antique clocks. The use of the saw on the file is the uh, primary means of obtaining parts that uh, uh, we cannot otherwise uh, uh, find for replacement. Uh, let's think about uh, uh, a part that uh, lends its wet, itself extremely well to um, uh, being sawed out. And that is uh, a snail for a snail cam for, for instance, an English grandfather clock. The snail cam would be laid out as a group of circles uh, starting at the center and progressively getting larger and larger and, and the size of these circles have to be taken from the dimensions on the striker, uh, striker uh, rack and the ratio of the distances from the pivots on the rack. But these are laid out uh, in circles and then the snail cam is laid out in sectors, in 12 sectors. And you can take a, a little saw blade, such as I used here, saw that snail out, touch it up uh, uh, with uh, a file, and uh, you can produce, with about, without a great amount of effort, a perfectly operating snail for a grandfather clock. That's one of the um, uh, so-called complicated but easy pieces to make. Making a rack is a bit more difficult. I've made both racks and snails uh, numerous times. If I had my choice, the rathers of the easier one is making the snail. Let's talk about making tools. We generally see in the uh, uh, technical writings, and uh, undoubtedly rightfully so, that uh, a craftsman should never make his own tools. Now, the logic of that situation is this. The logic is the craftsman can use his time to turn that same amount of time into more money than a tool cost. And that's generally true. That's generally true. But let me uh, approach this making tools uh, from uh, another aspect. Let's look at the punch set that I have right here. This punch set, there's a few, two or three or four pieces in here that's commercial. There's some tweezers and some spring hooks and whatnot. But this group of punches across here and right back here are all handmade punches. I made these uh, many years ago. They were made from a piece of uh, high carbon steel, a piece of drill rod that uh, I picked up in a scrap. As a matter of fact, you can even see, uh, possibly see the evidence here of a little bit of tarnish that was in that uh, punch when it was made, but there's none, uh, no uh, tarnish in the functional area of the punch. Why did I buy these? Uh, why did I make these punches rather than buy them? Well, the first place is I have never found a set of punches that does what these dimensions do. I need the punches, and in making the punch, you also gain the experience of, of uh, uh, increasing your skill which aids you in making other pieces. I don't categorically uh, uh, propose that we should make our tools, but to make a few, yes it's good. It's good, for, it's good for your skills, it's 
good for your mind. Let's uh, look at uh, uh, this bench block right here. I bought this bench block when I was an apprentice watchmaker. I paid one dollar and twenty-five cents for it. That's been forty or more over forty years ago, I suppose. Now, in the years that I've had this, had this bench block, I have remachined that surface numerous times. Numerous times. This bench block today uh, has a uh, uh, commands a price of ten to fifteen dollars in uh, the supply houses. I have machined this surface many times to bring it back to new. That says when I machined that surface and restored it to like new, I have earned myself fifteen dollars. So it's good business to do that. If you look at the holes in it, if you're familiar with this particular type of uh, bench block, and if I can get this in, in focus here, you'll find that it has approximately three times as many holes as it had originally. As a matter of fact, going through the back side, all of this ring right here, every one of these are new holes, through holes. There are some that are not through holes. Those holes have been added because there were sizes that I needed at particular times. Now, I can't immediately buy something uh, instantaneously. These holes were drilled uh, as uh, as required. So I feel that that is a, a good situation. This bench block here, let's take a look at this. This was made from a, a piece of uh, rusty steel that was picked up in a scrap somewhere. You can see the tarnish in the, in the edges of it. Uh, I machined this block and drilled these holes. I think, if I remember correctly, there's uh, 38 or 39 holes in that. They're all uh, recessed on the back side that gives them uh, uh, relief. And why did I do that? For well, a simple reason, in a drill index of numbered drills, I have every odd number in um, uh, 1, to, uh, uh, 1 to 60 plus some uh, other sizes. I have every one of those holes of the odd sizes. That says that anything that I'm working that is an even drill size, I have a close fitting odd hole as I need to use it. That is a, a lot of work to make that block, but it has been very valuable to me over the years. This particular bench block here is handmade, and uh, the holes in it are preferred English fraction holes. It's a square block. I picked that up in the scrap somewhere. It's finished off the surface and drilled it, and it has been very useful to me. For a soft block, I use uh, this type of thing. This is brass. Uh, to get out of the range of something here, this is this is a brass pad that uh, fits that. That gives me a soft uh, 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 block. And uh, this was a drop off from some part that I was making where I was slicing uh, wheel blanks from the end of uh, a piece of brass rod. This was a scrap. Turned the tenon on it because I damaged the uh, the end of it when I it, using it from time to time. I catch it in the lathe and remachine it and it's like new again. Used that for many years. These are same thing, uh, smaller sizes uh, of uh, uh, stumps to go in this uh, block. So that's the reason for making uh, a variety of your tools. It's not because that uh, it has to be done. It's not because you desire it. It's not because it's economical, but because it's the right thing to do under certain circumstances. Let's look at these uh, tools. This is a very good, very hard steel bench block. Very hard. Uh, sold by, uh, through uh, an American supply house made in a foreign country. It looks nice. It's very hard. Got sharp edges on it, and uh, it cost a bundle of money. The uh, the block plus the punches. Now we have flat face punches, flat face hollows, round face, and uh, a, a group.
group of sizes plus we have some hole closing punches. But in all sincerity, all sincerity, this is probably the most expensive tool that I've ever owned. For the primary reason, there are not enough punches here that you can pretty much universally fit your need. Consequently, you have to have a very selective job for one of these punches to be useful. There are no punches here that will pass through the holes of the bench block. And that limits what we can do with it very, uh, very sorely. It's a nice looking set. It's a good set. But it is not a universal set of great utility. However, I do get a great utility from this. You say, if it's not good, how can it be good? I get that utility from this set because I have other punches that will mate with these holes and other punches that will mate with these holes and other punches that will mate with these holes. So in doing that, it supplements another system, but as this a group alone is really a very limited uh, uh, value. Uh, let's look at the hole closing uh, punches. Uh, I don't want to debate the pro and con of uh, uh, workmanship of closing holes. Certainly there are cases where the closing a hole is the appropriate thing to do. And it's the simple thing to do and it can make a good repair. But hole closing as a universal method of, of uh, taking care of pivot problems is uh, uh, generally a mistake. Categorically it's not the way uh, to go. Uh, I find that uh, uh, with a full featured lathe and the ability to use it that I can make a, a bushing so quick that it makes it totally undesirable to use a cutting uh, uh, this is a uh, cup shaped with a, with a pump center. And I find uh, just really no need for that particular type of um, a punch. I slip these things out and use that punch for something else occasionally. But uh, the point is this. Simply having a particular set of punches, a particular set of files, a particular set of rotary burrs, or a particular set of screwdrivers, even though it's an assortment, doesn't mean that it's the full complement of tools that we need. Like the saw, like the screwdriver, like the wrench. There is no universal punch set, there is no universal saw set, there is no universal uh, 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 wrench set, screwdriver set, etc. If you do all the jobs, you almost have to have all of the tools. But there is a light at the end of this tunnel. If you've got a half of the tools, you can still do three-fourths of the job. So uh, you don't have to have everything. The tools that I have represent um, um, probably uh, close to 50 years of collection of tools and uh, a great expense. and. Uh, there is essentially a tool in this shop for every job that can come through the door. It takes years to do that. Unfortunately, by the time you amass that quantity of tools and the skill to use them, your candle is about burned out. Let's talk about some measuring equipment, problems of measurements. Let's take a look at something that is a very useful uh, type of uh, instrument in the clock shop. This is commonly called a vernier caliper. It's called a vernier caliper uh, because that it has a vernier scale along the lower edge, has a, a vernier scale along the upper edge. This is made by Helios of uh, uh, Germany and uh, measures to about seven inches. This uh, particular caliper is extremely fine. It's made of temperature compensated material and uh, it has engine divided um, uh, calibration along the scale here. It has, has a lock 
has provision for inside measurement and outside measurement. Uh, the problem that uh, you have with this is a vernier reading and unless you're very adept to vernier readings it, it takes a considerable amount of time to uh, make the reading. I've been reading vernier since I was a, a teenager and uh, I can read one almost as fast as I can a direct dial uh, indicator. Uh, this particular unit has inches on the lower edge and uh, uh, millimeters on the upper edge. It's a very fine uh, instrument, very desirable to have in the clock shop. This little instrument right here is um, uh, a small micrometer. Uh, see if we can get this into a little better focus here. goes up to a um, uh, hundred uh, Uh, not to 100, goes up to uh, 10 millimeters. 10 millimeters is a little scant of a half an inch, and it reads on the barrel to within 1 one hundredth of a millimeter. It's a nice little uh, German made uh, 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 micrometer, but uh, I found that it's really not, um, uh, really not all that great, though I've had it many years, and it's nice. The main pitfall for this, it does not have enough depth in here. There are so many things that you need to measure that you go in the depth. Set that aside, look at this one. Now this has got to be the uh, one of the crudest uh, micrometers ever made. Uh, as a teenager in a apprentice, uh, machinist apprenticeship, I got hold of this micrometer. It cost two dollars and twenty-five cents. But uh, oddly enough, it will measure to within one thousandth of an inch and it has a, a full inch range. I, I use that in rough work even until this day. Let's look a little further. Here's a couple of uh, steric micrometer barrels that uh, measure in the... I um, uh, have to take a look here. This, this, measures, this measures in the metric system and uh, measures to a hundredth of a millimeter. These are, are micrometer barrels that fit into several other frames that I have for measuring uh, uh, depth or what have you. They have uh, hemispheric uh, uh, tips on the end. I use those extensively as stops uh, in the uh, uh, lathe uh, tool slides. If we look a little further, we find a gauge that we might use as, as a a surface uh, type of dial gauge. This uh, particular instrument will measure plus or minus fifteen thousandths of an inch from a median uh, center point. Having a little trouble getting the um, uh, gauge in focus or from the, the light reflections. You can find quite where to go. But this little probe here uh, is where you take the reading. There are various uh, uh, fixtures here for mounting this. Uh, on a lathe, milling machine, or whatnot, and this may be placed against the work in the lathe and ride the work while the lathe is actually running and uh, uh, register the amount of material that's being removed in the final cut. It's a, a specialized type of, of measurement, though I use it uh, uh, a good bit. It's not something that is an everyday tool in the shop. A layout instrument it would do you well to own is a, is a uh, uh, small square. Uh, this is made by the Sterrett Company. Uh, this one has been around about 25 years. It has a cast iron frame on it which is, uh, uh, makes it very uh, durable and uh, very stable. And uh, this measures in 30 seconds of an inch, 64 of an inch, uh, 16 and uh, eighths of an inch. I use this almost universally as a, as a layout uh, instrument in uh, uh, part make, parts making. Let's look in this case. This case here has a depth micrometer in it and uh, this is to measure the depth of a hole in a surface. The probe measures from the tip of the probe from uh, uh, probe tip. Let's get us a better pointer here. Measures from from probe tip out here to the frame. 
this uh, uh, this particular instrument will just about drive you up the wall uh, when you go to use it. If you realize here that what we're doing is we're increasing distance as we turn the barrel to the right. We're increasing distance. That's backwards from the normal micrometer. This is calibrated uh, from low to high, traveling in that direction. And uh, being that it reads backwards from uh, most micrometers, it is very easy to read an error with that instrument. It's a specialized tool. It has, uh, uh, when you need that, there is no substitute uh, uh, for it. Let's uh, look a little further. Here's an instrument that's made in Germany by uh, uh, Helios. And uh, as we look at this, uh, this is in the metric system only. This is only in the uh, uh, metric system. This is uh, uh, 10 millimeters at this point. Uh, 10 millimeters being a little less than a half an inch right here. And uh, uh, the smallest uh, reading that uh, has a dial calibration on it is 0 0.05 millimeters. This is very good, very useful, uh, very frequently used. However, I have another it's identical to it, it's, except it's calibrated in um, uh, the English system in thousandths of an inch, which I more commonly use. The reason being for that is that most raw materials and uh, uh, most tools that we have in this country are dimensioned in the English system. And what happens when you uh, use uh, those types of things and go to the metric system, you're constantly converting one way or the other. Uh, of the lathes that I have, uh, I have uh, uh, two compounds on some of them that are calibrated in the English system. Some is calibrated in the metric system. Both systems are, are good and useful in their appropriate place. I have lathe chucks that uh, are dimensioned in uh, both metric and English system. Uh, it, it amounts to this. If what you're working with is predominantly English measurements, use the English system. If it's predominantly uh, uh, metric measurements, use the metric system. Let's uh, look at another item here. This is uh, telescoping gauges to measure the inside, the ID of something. We can take this gauge, and they're made in step sizes, slip this into a hole, loosen the tip and let this gauge telescope out to a particular ID diameter. We can lock that in that position. These are crowned tips. We can touch it in there and lock it. Pull that out and when we pull the gauge out of the hole, whatever the ID is, then we simply measure across it with some other instrument we are transferring. This is a transfer tool that transfers an ID measurement to be scaled with an OD tool. This is uh, uh, a very fine instrument for measuring the inside of anything that's uh, fairly large. The smallest uh, tool in this group ranges from 5 sixteenths to a half inch. Uh, the largest one uh, goes up to, I don't know, uh, uh, six inches it says here on the box. This is a useful tool, but not every day used in the uh, uh, clock shop. Now let's, uh, let's look at something else here. Let's look at the tools that's the workhorse, the measurement instruments that's the workhorse of the, of the clock shop. Let's see if we can recognize some of these. The old timers will recognize this. This is a crystal gauge. This is a German Al Simon machine company gauge. And uh, one scale of it is in uh, GS units, German Al Simon units. The other scale of it is in uh, uh, metric units. It's used to measure the bezel of uh, uh, watches to determine what size crystal that uh, you would use in it. Let's look at this. This is a drill gauge. If you let your small drill bits get mixed up in their holder and get out of place and 
and how do you find your way back? Uh, this is 61 to 80 drill sizes. These holes uh, in the back side of this are drilled with uh, uh, drill bits 61 to 80 and uh, uh, as we look through this we can trial fit and find the number of the drill bit. I find this of, of very very little value. This is a more theoretical value than it is practical value because if you maintain your drill bits uh, in their own index, you never need that. If the uh, drill bit is out of the index and you want to know what it is, it's as simple as picking, this is not a drill bit, but you just slip a gauge like that on it and take the reading and you don't fret with trying to find the proper hole uh, in that. Okay, let's look at this one. This is uh, uh, six inches this is six inches by um, uh, uh, 30 seconds and uh, 60 fourths. On the back side of this we have a, a useful scale and uh, this useful scale on the back side uh, is a brown and sharp uh, scale. Right here it says brown and sharp number eight is 128 thousandths. We come down here brown and sharp number 20 is um, uh, 32 thousandths of an inch. This is primarily made where you're dealing in, in uh, uh, wire gauges and rod stock that's dimensioned in the Brown and Sharp system. We also have a uh, convenient uh, quick checker here. If we slip this right in here and pull it down to that, we can, we can take off of this uh, a gauge. Uh, from this. Now that particular rod, this is number 8, brown and sharp number 8, this is brown and sharp number 10. It looks like that this is um, uh, somewhere about uh, 9, 8 and a half uh, to 9. If we look down this we find that uh, 8 is 128 thousandths. That's a little larger than an eighth of an inch. We find a 9 is 114 thousandths which is uh, about 11 thousandths smaller. This rod is an eighth of an inch in diameter, and we slip it in there, and that tells us the size of the, uh, the rod. If we're dealing in brown and sharp gauges, that's a very valuable uh, instrument. This is a precision uh, engine divided layout uh, rule. Simply a very hard steel rule, engine divided, surface ground, polished edges, and it's used uh, for laying out uh, uh, very close dimensions. It's hard. You can scribe against it with a hard scriber and uh, uh, in, in your layout. It's calibrated in uh, a variety of uh, uh, dimensions. These markers in this last inch over here are ten thousandths of an inch apart. These markers over here are twelve to an inch. These markers right here are fifty to an inch. These are twenty to an inch. Uh, down here are ten. This, this group is 24, this group is 48. We look on the other side, we have a 16, a 28, and uh, a 14, and a 64. So that we can uh, make visual layouts in uh, uh, all of those uh, uh, divisions of an inch. This rule is, is more of a machinist uh, rule, an English uh, machinist rule. Up here we're divided in tenths of an inch, down here in hundredths of an inch, and uh, if we look on the other side it's thirty seconds and sixty fourths. Kind of duplicates some of the other instruments that we've looked at. Let's see what we have here. Uh, this one has the same set of calibration as the uh, uh, last one that we looked at. Uh, this particular one here has some additional uh, information on it. We have 30 seconds and 60 fourths of an inch on this side for six inches, that's the divisions, but when we look at this side we find the preferred English uh, uh, dimensions transferred to decimals. For instance, a 64th of an inch is 15.6 thousandths. If we go to a familiar uh, uh, number, a half inch is 500 thousandths. That gives us immediate transfer between proper fractions and uh, uh, decimals. This instrument is uh, uh, a protractor. 
we can loosen this up or we can turn the, the scale on this to these uh, fixed angles are uh, interpolated in between the uh, angles are 30, 45, 60 degrees etc and uh, it also doubles as a depth gauge like, like this for the measurements. This is uh, the same uh, type of gauge. This instrument is a type that was uh, provided to apprentice watchmakers immediately after World War II. This belonged to someone who scratched his initials and it is called AT, called a millimeter gauge. And uh, apprentice watchmakers use that to measure and make balance staffs and, and a lathe. And I'll tell you, if you can use a, an instrument as crude as that and make a, a good balance staff, you're a real craftsman. That's not a very good, uh, not a very high class uh, tool there. Looking at this, this has uh, quite a bit of, of utility, but over a period of time you'll store all the information in your mind and then you'll cease to use it. Uh, this is drill sizes. This is a number one drill, number two drill, number three, so on. This is numbered drills uh, from one to sixty. That's the, the drill sizes that I uh, told in the uh, uh, chat tape number one that the one through sixty is the most important sizes for the clockmaker. What it gives you over here along the margin, it gives you the um, uh, decimal dimension of these drills in uh, uh, decimal values, their diameter, and uh, then we have a table here that says uh, a drill, number 44, uh, and it has a certain uh, uh, body size, and, and if you want to tap, for instance, a 256 hole, uh, you use a, a number uh, 50 drill if it's to be tapped. If the thread is to pass through it, you use a number 44 drill. This is the origin of the uh, information that I urged in the previous tape to uh, be very careful about uh, sizing the tang sizes and uh, the hole dimensions for taps and dies. This unit here is Swiss lines on one edge and uh, uh, American watch gauges on the other edge. It's commonly called a Lancashire uh, gauge there for the American uh, watch sizes. We've looked at another uh, measurement tool that looked like that. We've also looked at one that looked like that and this. And then of course this is the familiar tool that we uh, uh, have. This is a metric feeler gauge. Uh, we find that uh, when we look at a metric uh, uh, gauge, something of this type, that we may often wonder, well, is it as good as we think it is or is it not? The feeler gauge is a good rough instrument, but it is not a precision instrument uh, of some of the other uh, uh, tools. This particular instrument here measures uh, up to it's, uh, up to five inches in uh, thousandths of an inch. That is probably that is, is probably the most uh, used tool in my shop in uh, a measurement instrument. Possibly uh, it runs a close second to really just a stick rule. The, um, uh, this particular instrument is made by uh, uh, Helios uh, in uh, uh, Germany. But as we look at these instruments we find that my collection over a period of years of instruments is more extensive than a normal clockmaker would necessarily have to have. A lot of these are pure niceties, but approximately half of these are real necessities in the clock shop. Let's look at another instrument that we use on uh, uh, on measurements. When we're measuring small parts, we have problem holding the piece and holding the uh, 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 measuring instrument at the same time. This device here is uh, simply a holder to support a micrometer. This micrometer is, is a very fine uh, instrument, measures up to an inch. It's temperature compensated, has tungsten carbide uh, ground jaws in it. That says that we can lay down onto something uh, quite hard with this without any fear of damaging the uh, uh, the jaws in it. Normally you would hold a micrometer like this in your finger 
when you're doing the, the measurement, this is the way that this is uh, normally done to, to roll a barrel in the micrometer. And uh, uh, in addition to that, if you need to roll it a great distance, you roll it on your arm or roll it on your hand. This is the way that you make the fast uh, uh, movement and the way you hold it. Uh, you sit it in this as a holder to uh, whatever that you wish to measure and this might be uh, turned at a variety of angles uh, for pure convenience. This instrument here was made up in the machine shop at some time in the distant past. This uh, barrel that is in this, and for some reason that barrel is, there it is, this is uh, one of the uh, uh, Sterrett micrometer barrels that goes into this and measures against an anvil uh, down below. And uh, this unit was made up to measure with the micrometer barrel. Also, it uh, uh, functions equally well with the one inch uh, dial gauges which we saw on the uh, lathe compounds in uh, tape number one. Those dial gauges will mount right in here and for quick measurements you just lift the, the um, probe, slip something under it, let it down, get the immediate measurement uh, on the dial gauge. These are, are uh, frequently used uh, in measuring repetitive measurements of parts. Let's try another type of measurement. This instrument is known as a height gauge. This has a very sharp carbide tipped scriber with a very flat uh, bottom surface on it. We let this down like this until we're down to floor level and we calibrate with, with the uh, adjustments over here, we calibrate this vernier uh, scale here, vernier scale right in this area, we calibrate that to zero, zero, zero in thousandths of an inch. Now, for layout purposes, let's say that we're uh, laying out uh, uh, a component and uh, let's uh, imagine that we were going to uh, lay out the row of these uh, holes. Let's see if we can get this in focus here. Don't look like we can. Let's say we're going to drill this row of holes here at a, a certain height. The way this is used is in conjunction with a granite surface plate. Over here to my right in the corner is a granite plate that's about uh, 15 inches square. It's about uh, 5 inches uh, thick and it weighs about as much as a small tombstone. It has a precision ground uh, surface on it. The way you would use this is using your, your uh, angle plate which has a precision ground surface this is a, a square, really, has a precision ground surface on the bottom. This would sit on the angle plate. We would run down here to zero uh, uh, height, read our zero on the, front, uh, on the vernier. We would lift this up to approximately the value we want, and then we would dial in right here with this slow tuning rate the distance that we want to mark here. So we take this, and I have a little problem in, in getting this here. We would take this, and then with this sharp edge, we would scribe that line right across there. This makes a, a scribe mark. And if we want to lay out progressive holes, our progressive locations, uh, for instance, uh, in a clock plate and building a plate, uh, you, you dimension the, the system so that, that your lowest hole is a certain dimension from a true bottom edge. The next hole is a dimension higher. The next hole is still another dimension higher. The next hole is a dimension higher. So you scribe these lines on it. Now you take your clock plate. Let's imagine this might be the clock plate. We have the horizontal scribe lines. Then we turn it over on edge like this and we have the coordinate lines. So we come down and we pull the coordinate lines on it. And as we pull the uh, coordinate lines, we can have these located. These holes can be located any place on the plate that are coordinates from a true lower edge and a true side. 
that says that we can go back to any one of those holes at any point in time or any one of those measurements of this vernier gauge and we can find them with the highest degree of precision. We can lay out the front plate dimensionally, we can lay out the back plate, and at those coordinates they will be identical. They do not have to be drilled in pairs, so this is uh, quite frequently done. You can lay these out with the uh, uh, height gauge, the granite surface plate, and uh, uh, your square, and uh, you can locate these so that you can lay out any number of, of plates that are identical in all of their dimensional features. This is a, a very fine tool and a very important tool if you're in serious clock building uh, business. There are other tools that's uh, used. I uh, haven't looked into other micrometers. This one is the keepsake. It's the poorest, most inexpensive one that I have. Uh, I have uh, some micrometers that uh, measure in both the metric and uh, English dimension simultaneously. I personally would uh, counsel you that that is a waste of money because 50% of everything you're doing is not what you want, always. I have vernier calipers of this particular type that has both the scales, has two sets of pointers on them. But 50% of the readings that come up is not, are not the readings that you want at the particular time. Again, it's like the universal screwdriver a universal pair of pliers or a universal drill bit. I don't know what a universal drill bit would be, I suppose a reamer. But uh, uh, the point is this, if you're working English system, you need English tools. If you're working metric system, you need the metric tools. You need to take out all the confusion that can be taken out and clarify everything that you uh, need. So that's a, a, a point of measurement uh, uh, techniques. I would counsel everyone to have good, good stick rules. I would counsel everyone to have at least one good micrometer. This is not the good micrometer. I would counsel everyone to have uh, at least one good vernier caliper. Uh, I would uh, uh, shun the uh, thought of a plastic uh, uh, unit, though they are uh, fairly good. I would tell you that if you want the best, most dimensionally stable, and the most accurate of the vernier calipers, get the one with the vernier gauge, uh, uh, vernier scale, like this one. If you want the thing that's the easiest to use and almost as good, get the one with the dial gauge. The dial gauge is fast, fast. But when it really comes down to the hardcore accuracy of linear measurements, it's this with the vernier scale, or it's the height gauge, the height gauge with the uh, uh, vernier scale. This, uh, this situation is, is, is about the king of a linear uh, dimensional uh, measurement tool. We'll uh, end our uh, measurement uh, talk here and, and uh, a little later we'll go into another subject matter. This parcel of work with de will deal with making clock bushings and bushing a clock plate. The illustration that we see here is a piece of 1 8 inch bronze stock in the lathe that has had the first turning operation completed. In all probability the motor noise uh, when this is running will obscure any voice. I'll turn the uh, motor on and make a small cut so that we may see what is uh, happening here in this particular operation. The thing that you will see here is that the eighth inch uh, bronze stock has been tapered slightly on the end, bringing the diameter from 125 thousandths down to about uh, 122 thousandths. Also, it's chamfered on the uh, outer edge, and a center is uh, uh, caught to receive the drill for which we will drill this uh, bushing. Now drill the hole 
with a bit 25 thousandths of an inch in diameter. We'll, we'll turn back the uh, uh, tool rest and uh, go into the center hole and drill the pivot hole. See the process of drilling? We can see the sufficiently deep at uh, uh, this point and uh, we'll pause and make another setup. We're in the process of cutting the bushing off uh, from the parent stock at this point. It's almost cut off. We'll uh, continue cutting. is near drop off point and uh, to keep from losing it we'll pause here and change to a new technique now. Now our bushing is near finished or near uh, cut off point we'll flip the uh, tool rest back and it's cut almost through to the uh, uh, bore diameter so we take a smooth jaw plier and break the bushing loose. Now uh, the next thing is to not lose the bushing. So the thing to do here is to catch it on a brooch and uh, I want this on the brooch with the uh, inside of the uh, bushing that is the, the side that's toward the uh, uh, pulley of the lathe. I want it toward the handle on the brooch. All right, we uh, have this on the brooch at this point and uh, let's see if we can get it in, uh, in view uh, on the focus. Bushing is on, on the uh, brooch at this point in time. Now let's pause and make another setup. The uh, plate that I intend to put this bushing in is about 43 thousandths of an inch uh, uh, thick. This bushing right at this point has a measurement of about 75 thousandths. So we need to take this down in length a very considerable amount. Now if I were using uh, a commercial bushing I would have the same problem of having to uh, reduce the uh, length on it. So we slip that in there on the uh, on the brooch, look at the situation to see that it's approximately true, and now we will uh, uh, turn the uh, uh, length of the bush into a, a shorter dimension.
also I can't get in close enough to see this through an eye loop so let's see how much that we have uh, pulled off of this we slip the brooch in it so that it's not lost release it from the chuck take the uh, a micrometer and measure it. We're about ten thousandths over in length. We're about fifty-five thousandths uh, right at this point. So let's go back in the chuck. We lock up the headstock so we can tighten the drawbar, and we look again. And uh, we want to attempt to get this uh, bore, the hole in the bore, approximately straight. Uh, we will ream the hole and, and straighten that up when the time comes, but it's best if we can have the hole approximately straight, and that should be satisfactory there. Now, to determine that ten thousandths of an inch, the first thing we will do is to turn a chamfer on the end that appears to be about as much as we want to reduce the length. Then we come back and reduce the length until that chamfer is gone. pushing out and uh, see what we have at uh, this point. Again we capture it on the brooch and uh, we measure the uh, thickness of it and we're about forty seven thousandths of an inch. We need to uh, uh, take it off about five more thousandths. Now I want to get my eye loop down here and see what we have and uh, I believe I'll take the remainder off of, uh, let me see the chamfer side, I'll take the remainder off of the, the uh, uh, side that we were cutting on at uh, the last uh, cut. Approximately right. We'll take a little cut off of that. We only want to take about five thousandths of an inch at uh, this point. Let's see what we have now. Slip the brooch in. Pull it out. Put the uh, micrometer to it, and we're about forty-six thousandths of an inch, and I believe we'll let it go right there, and we'll call that the bushing to go into our uh, plate. We'll uh, cut the camera and uh, make a new setup. Let's talk about the uh, place that we're going to insert the bushing. We're looking at uh, a hole right here in the plate. Now this is not a pivot hole, but this is a demonstration hole in the plate, and we will bush that hole to uh, fit a particular uh, pivot size that we have selected from elsewhere in the movement. This is the reamer that we will use to uh, prepare the hole. This, uh, this reamer is made from a piece of uh, high carbon steel shank. It's precision sized right in this area. See if we can find the focal point here. Right in, in this area to about 120, 119 or 120 thousandths of an inch. Uh, it is cylindrical in that area. The reamer tapers then all the way to the end. It has a D-shaped section as you can see here and as you ream up this it's an enlarging reamer until it passes beyond this uh, this section right here and at that point it is a tight snug fit and burnishes the hole to about 119 or 120 thousandths of an inch. As we look uh, at the bushing that we have 
we measure this bushing, I'm about 122, 121 or 122 thousandths of an inch. So we're going to have a press fit of about uh, one or two thousandths of an inch on this uh, uh, bushing. Now, when this was machined, we have one end of this, uh, which is chamfered. So we'll press the chamfered end in first, and uh, that will leave a slight ring around the bushing uh, in the plate. Now, we will take this plate and the reamer, and we will go to a drill press and prepare this. We'll lubricate this reamer, we'll run it down through the hole, and uh, that will enlarge the hole, maintaining the uh, uh, original center on it, and we'll take it to the size of a press fit uh, of this uh, particular bushing. I made this reamer uh, quite a number of years ago, and uh, the uh, reamer is, is sized to dimensions that I carry in my head, and when I make bushings, I made this bushing today to uh, demonstrate the action, but when I make bushings, I usually make a dozen or so at the time, making them a little long, and uh, here is uh, uh, a bundle of these on a little uh, hairpin, looks like there may be ten or so there. I can make these bushings when I make the setup and uh, uh, do this at uh, uh, convenience, that is the camera not being an interference to me. I can make one of these bushings about every two or three minutes. And in so doing, I have the bushing the correct diameter and the correct length in the two or three minutes. That is the reason that I uh, do not use commercial bushings because it takes me that long to find one in the box which then must be reworked. Now we'll cut the camera and go to uh, the drill press and uh, open this hole. We place the uh, reamer in the drill press, this being the, the uh, reamer, a sturdy bench block with a hole for the reamer to pass through and um, then we select the hole that is to receive the bushing and we've got a little problem there uh, we've got the pillar in the way on the underside I believe I can get this right here yes I can now we start the drill press the arm may get in the, in the way operating the handle of the drill press we go down through this, continue to sink the hole until we pass completely through the plate. We come out, we inspect to see that we did, and we did. We cut the power, and we find that we've raised a little burr. Uh, find the way in the uh, Back in the camera, we've raised a little burr on the on the edge here on each side. We'll have to remove that with a chamfering tool. So we'll cut the camera and we'll get the chamfering tool and take care of that. The chamfering tool that we need to use is, is uh, a machinist countersink. This one's a little large but completely suitable. We take that in the fingers go in the hole and give it about uh, a couple of turns like that inspect it, we need a little more it's best that you not do this under power that you might uh, uh, overcut it and then we do the same thing on the uh, the lower side now we have the hole for this bushing which is uh, four millimeters and uh, three millimeters in diameter or about 119 or 120 thousandths of an inch. We'll remove the tools, I'll cut the camera and then we'll make another setup. We have the bushing ready to insert at this point. Here is the uh, uh, hole that we're expecting to place it in right here. We have a, a hard surface bench block that we will uh, drive this against and um, uh, the bushing is latched onto our brooch. The, uh, we'll have to take a look at this. The uh, inside of the bushing is the one toward the handle of the brooch. 
that means that I need to place it in here uh, in this position. The bushing is in the hole and uh, we sit a ball face punch on top of it and uh, alas I don't have my hammer in hand so let me cut the the uh, uh, camera for a moment. Turn the camera on again and let's uh, give this a try and, and uh, see what we have here. This is the ball face uh, punch uh, pointing down. Center that on the bushing and uh, uh, strike it in place. Now the thing that uh, we should have is this bushing a few thousandths of an inch uh, uh, above the surface. So the next thing we will do is flush that uh, uh, dimensional difference which gives us uh, a tight fitting uh, bushing uh, seated down. Uh, flat face punch and uh, we give it uh, a stroke there and we look at the other side. Let's uh, stroke it a time or so over here in case it will burr. Alright, now let's take a, a brush, brush this off, and we'll take a look at what the bushing looks like. Now, if we can get up in uh, close with the camera, let me cut the camera and I'll try refocusing, see if we can get in close. Let's see if we can take a look at the bushing that's been staked in place. We can see it uh, in the lower central portion of the uh, picture. And if we turn the plate over, let's uh, look at the other side and we can see it, uh, see it there. The bushing is firmly in place and now uh, what remains is to ream and chamfer uh, the bushing to uh, suit the particular pivot that will go in the hole. Let's cut the camera and we'll look for some tools to do that. Let's look at reaming the hole now. We drop the brooch in the hole, we're ready to ream it, and we'll look at it at uh, uh, this angle, and we'll attempt to find that it's at, at right angles. It is that uh, uh, this angle equals this angle. We turn it uh, 90 degrees and, and uh, we want to uh, get the same situation. The perspective in the camera is not quite uh, what it is uh, right at my eye, but we ream this and we ream it from both sides and that gives us a, approximately an hourglass uh, hole. Look at this situation. Now let's drop the uh, pivot in it that we intend to go in there. Now let's look <coughs> at a little um, <coughs> test technique here. We'll place our finger on top of this and go round and round like this. See about what the angle is that we have and that the angle is approximately equal in every direction. What uh, is commonly called a five degree clearance hole is a hole in which the pivot will tip five degrees in, in each direction. And a plate this thin, that's uh, uh, pretty nominal clearance and the hole is hourglass. We would find that this, this pivot hole uh, nicely fits that, that pivot right there at that point. Now one thing that uh, we have to be concerned about, we have to uh, chamfer or break the burr that's in the edge of the hole here. We have to chamfer the oil sink that is in the uh, outside of the hole. We will have to find a, a different uh, uh, chamfering tool to do that. Let's use this little uh, uh, center drill or chamfering tool and uh, we go to the to the outside and we work out the oil sink on it. Work it out till it's about uh, three diameters of the pivot. Go to the inside and we just break the edge. Now at this point we would do well to use a burnishing uh, that is a smooth brooch to deburr this or we may do this very lightly with this cutting brooch. Remember we have made the um, uh, bushing from very hard bronze and very hard bronze does not uh, require the burnishing 
that uh, this would if it were purely a soft brass plate. Now what we have, what we have is uh, uh, this. This looks like considerable slack right here when we go around this way. But if we check the side shake on it, we find that the side shake is very low. The uh, the hole is hourglass in shape, and we want it to be hourglass in shape. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, uh, if the mainspring it fully wind uh, racks the movement slightly, it will not bring the pivot into a bind. This is one of the sins of uh, of uh, uh, bushing a plate. It's bushing it up to a point that when the power goes on the uh, uh, the entire frame of the movement, that the plates are racked, twisted, uh, offset slightly, and uh, the bushing that was supposed to cure one uh, ill creates another by going into a bind. Now this is a, a practical bushing situation. It's easy to do, and this is the reason that I uh, uh, do not uh, particularly ascribe to uh, closing pivot holes. If the pivot hole can be closed with a simple punch and a simple stroke, not a hard uh, uh, punch, but let's say a, a spherical shaped punch as uh, this particular one is. If it can be closed slightly with that and trued up and round, I consider that to be a good repair. But to use a punch with a pump center and a cutting cup type end and really lay into the movement uh, uh, hard and distort the plate, I don't consider that to be a, a good repair. I would prefer to go to the bushing as in this case. If we look at this and uh, if we can uh, get this into the picture here and, and focus, we will find that it's perfectly flush with the plate on both sides and uh, uh, properly sized. The reamer will automatically center, the reamer will automatically center on the hole that exists. Now, this has a possible uh, uh, disadvantage. The disadvantage is that if that hole has walked from where, we find the new hole slight, in a slight uh, devious position from the original hole. If we have that circumstance, if we suspect that that would happen, we should take a depthing tool and measure the centers from possibly the other side of the plate, locate where the center should be and set that up on the depthing tool against, or a pair of depthing tools, against other locations on the plate. Place the bushing in the plate with uh, uh, no hole, the, an undrilled bushing. Identify the location that we should be in and then drill the bushing, uh, which would uh, give you the bushing hole slightly off center but in the correct position for the movement. Now, the next thing that we should do when we place the bushing in is to assemble the uh, movement with the plate that goes over this with the single wheel in it. Nothing but this one wheel. Assemble the plate and take the finger and spin this wheel so that it spins rapidly. Then take the the, uh, the movement and attempt to rack it or stress it and see if it tends to be a braking action on the spinning of the wheel. While it's spinning, upend it. Be sure that we are not uh, getting uh, frictions on a, a conical shoulder or a burr on the shoulder or a burr uh, in the movement. Be sure that with that single wheel that it spins freely and that there's no bind no, no matter what position that we place the movement in. The second thing to do is to slip in the adjacent wheel that uh, mates with this and spin just those two wheels and look for the gearing action between wheel teeth and pinion to be sure that there's no conflict there. The um, uh, situation of working in uh, less than excellent job and thinking that you can inspect the error out of it on a test run at the end of the job is really folly. The uh, test run of a movement should not consist of more than about 24 hours of run. You might try this with a mainspring most of the way up and again with the most of the way down. But the movement should be put together 
with a proficiency and with a confidence that uh, an extensive test run is unnecessary. So this is how easy it is to uh, place bushings in movements. It's really not a particular problem. It's not a particular problem if you uh, uh, don't have a bushing tool. If you have uh, a lathe and uh, you make your own bushings, uh, what that says is that your raw material, that you have every size of bushing in stock that's in the world. If, you're, if your bushing material is raw material and you have the lathe and you're going to turn the bushing, one small quantity of raw material fits all circumstances. That's the beauty of making your own uh, bushings. The second thing is that the drill press, the little drill press that I use, costs less than one-third of a commercial bushing tool. It has many, many, many different functions. If you like, and I uh, don't particularly desire to do so, but I uh, have done on many occasions, I can use the, the drill press to press this bushing into place, just as you would in a commercial bushing tool. Uh, I prefer to drive them in with a punch, and the reason that I prefer to drive these in with a punch is that uh, I machined this bushing just a few thousandths longer than the plate is thick. I made it a press fit, a light press fit to go in. But after it was in place, I went on to the, the hardened bench block with a flat-faced punch.